I gotta be honest, guys. Walt Disney Animation has really let me down these past few years. Wreck-It Ralph 2 was a total disaster that completely assassinated the characters of the first movie. Frozen 2 was a rush mess that, when it ended and all the characters started wrapping up, I couldn't help but think, wait... That's it. And Raya and the Last Dragon was a movie so forgettable that even right now writing this, and recording this, and editing this, am I just now remembering that it exists? Things were so bad that it felt like it would take a miracle to make things right again. <sighs> so because of all this, I really wasn't excited for Disney's Encanto. I just felt like it would be another misguided, mismanaged, miserable cash grab capitalizing on the Disney brand. <sighs> and well, I hate to say it, but Encanto is a masterpiece! Oh my god, look at the emotion! Mac is back. And Canto was released in November of 2021 and has quickly become one of Disney's most beloved films since. It's got great characters, excellent music, muy bien animacion, and a wonderful story, all of which we'll be discussing today. And so, without further ado, you know, this doesn't seem quite right. I mean, we're doing a Disney princess musical, well, here's our music, there's our princess, so to speak, so what are we missing? I'm the daughter of the chief. Same difference. No. If you wear a dress <laughs> and you have an animal sidekick, <laughs> You're a princess. Oh, of course, the cute sidekick. Well, this movie doesn't have anything like that on Plus You Got the House, but I have just a thing for that, you see. One moment. Do not attempt this at home, unless you're me. As you can see, nothing inside the hat, and nothing up my sleeve. But then, with just a simple heave, we then see what we receive. Introducing Mercury, who will be assisting me in reviewing this movie today. Go on, tell us a little bit about yourself. Right, I wasn't born with a name, I was born without one. And then after I was born, I was given one. And that about sums up my life so far. Well spoken. And now, without further, further ado, Encanto. The movie begins with a story detailing the origin of the film's central MacGuffin, this candle. Once upon a time, Alma Madrigal, her husband Pedro, and their three newly born children are fleeing for their lives from... Conquistadors? Yeah, during the Thousand Days War, caused by political unrest in the Republic of Colombia, leaned hostilities throughout the country and neighboring territories, as well as an estimated 100 to 150,000 casualties. Wow, now, now that's what I like to see in my Disney movie. Because of this, Pedro sacrifices himself so that Alma and the children can escape, and through some miracle, the candle she holds becomes enchanted. An encanto, you see. A charm where so long as the family survives and stays strong, the miraculous flame will never go out. It raises the mountains in the area so the war cannot reach them and can Constructs a house for Alma and her family to call home, La Casita. It lives! It's like Monster House, but if the monster was chill. But more importantly, when each of Alma's children came of age, they each received their own personal gift in the form of power special to them, as well as a personal room and to help them hone said gift. And then when their children came of age, they received the same miraculous power as well, thus bringing us to the present where Abuela Alma tells the little Mirabel that today is the day she is to receive her gift. Make your family proud. It then cuts to ten years later, where we see the magic also the leader of a thriving community of people, and we are reintroduced to Mirabelle, who will be our main protagonist this evening. And right at the gate, we're hit with the film's very first song, meant to introduce us to the setting, each of the many characters, and what the deal is with all of them, as told by Mirabelle to a bunch of curious children. Alright, let's run down the list. Of course, there's Abuela, the matriarch of the family, and the one in charge of most everything involving the family and the community. Tia Peppa, Mirabelle's aunt, whose emotions control the weather, or maybe they control her. Tio Felix, Peppa's husband, who married into the family, and all-around good guy. Then there's Bruno, who We'll talk about Bruno. We'll get to. Then there's Mama Julieta, Mirabel's loving mother who can heal people with her food. Such as Papa Augustine, Mirabel's father, who often gets horribly maimed. Well, nothing a good meal won't fix. On to the next generation, starring with Mirabel's cousins, Dolores has super hearing and as such as a pro gossiper. Camilo can shapeshift into people and is a bit of a prankster. And Antonio, the youngest cousin, will be receiving his gift later that day. Now finally wrapping this up, there's Isabella, Mirabel's oldest sister, who can control plants and the like, and at last the middle sister, Louisa, who is super strong. I like this song, it has tons of energy and it's surprisingly effective at introducing us to each of the characters. After the film was over on my first watch, I thought maybe there were some family members I'd missed, and so I looked up the official family tree, only to realize, no, I remembered everyone. Maybe not all of their names, since in general it can be hard to catch names in a film, especially when sung or rapped at four times speed, but their powers, what they looked like, and visuals associated with them were all communicated pretty well. Let's go, let's go. 
In a film with so many characters, it can be easy to lose track of who's who if the movie doesn't juggle its screen time properly, so color me impressed. Then, after explaining the sum of what makes her family special, the kids become incredibly interested in Mirabelle and what makes her special in the song Frenzies as Mirabelle tries to evade and change the subject until... What are you doing? Uh, they were just asking about the family and... She was about to tell us about her super awesome gift! Oh, Mirabel didn't get one. So fancy that, in a family filled with magically talented people, Mirabelle has nothing and is the odd one out, like a musician whose family hates music. While everyone else got an awesome ability and a personalized room related to it, when it was time for Mirabelle to receive the same thing, she was denied it, and no one knows why. Yet despite having lived with this massive disappointment for a full decade, she still tries to maintain that cheery disposition and love for her family by working hard to make them proud anyway, even if she is often treated like dead weight. Mirabel, I know you want to help. But tonight must go perfectly. The whole town relies on our family, on our gifts. So the best way for some of us to help is to step aside. Let the rest of the family do what they do best. Okay? Mm -hmm. I think what makes the story so strong is that each of these characters interact and function like a real family would, and includes both the moments where they can be pretty harsh to each other, as well as the ones where they're genuinely looking after each other, which, in some cases, can be hard to parse. The next scene is a good example of the latter. Listening to what Abuela tells her, Mirabel retreats to the nursery, where the Madrigal kids who have yet to receive their gift sleep, including Antonio, who is to receive his gift later that night. But of course, given all the pressure being put on this night, he's nervous about it, because, well, the last gift ceremony didn't work. And I like this scene a lot. There's no music, and all the dialogue is hushed as Mirabel tries to cheer Antonio up and get him mentally ready for his big day. You know what? You don't have to worry about me. Because I have an amazing family. And an amazing house. And an amazing you. And seeing you get your special gift in your door, that's going to make me way more happy than anything. They could have easily taken Mirabelle's character the jealous rat and made her resentful of her family for being denied a gift. But instead, Mirabelle's character shows some real maturity as she puts her family first before her problems. Like when she gives Antonio a little handcrafted knitted animal doll so he won't feel lonely after he graduates from the nursery. The goodwill and genuine love that Mirabelle feels for her family is very palpable. After that little heart-to-heart, -heart, Lacacita lets them know it's time for the festivities, leading into the next song, which is very festive, as we see the fiesta that everyone was working on setting up earlier. This part is really cool because the focus shifts to the guests for a little bit, it, to make the viewer feel like they're attending the party as well. It really hits you as you win is the playful way La Casita moves its pieces, Louisa not noticing the kids hang from her because she's so strong, Isabella putting on this little show. It all really sucks you in and fills you with a sense of wonder. <laughs> what is this, some kind of Disney movie? Eventually, it is time for Antonio's ceremony, where he's meant to walk down the aisle and up the steps to his door, but despite the pep talk, he just can't summon the courage. So, he pleads to Mirabelle to help him get there, and the two of them start walking. Through Antonio's ceremony, Mirabelle is forced to relive the moment when it was her turn to make this walk, and the heartbreak that it led to. It flashes back to that moment periodically during this scene, almost as if Mirabelle's becoming lost in thought and memories of the past, memories of utter letdown. There is genuine tension to this scene as you worry that the miracle might not actually work, just like what happened to Mirabelle, but you just won't know until it happens. Schrodinger's miracle, if you will. And so, it fills you with a genuine sense of wonder when it does! Antonio's gift turns out that he can talk to animals, where before he found comfort and companionship in Mirabelle, now he has friends in Critters, which was foreshadowed earlier. His door shapes up to reflect like this, and upon opening it, the room forms before our very eyes. It's bigger on the inside, that's all. Oh, that's all. Then, after a quick showcase of how awesome this room is, we get this line. A gift just as special as you. Whatever gift awaits will be just as special as you. <gasps> we need a picture! Everyone! After this sharp reminder, Abuela assembles everybody for a photograph. Everyone except Mirabelle, who is cut from the picture. Time slows as Mirabelle finds herself among the no-name townsfolk, and we get our third song featuring Mirabelle solo. Up until this point, Mirabelle had been keeping up the facade of being the black sheep of the family didn't bother her at all, even telling herself at the start of the song that she shouldn't be upset. But then that quickly falls away, and Mirabelle belts out this beautiful aria, lamenting her lack of powers are placed in the family magic elf. Whereas in the first song, Mirabelle goes down the list of things her family can do. Here, she goes down the same 
list only framed as things that she can't do. At one point, we peek behind Abuela's door, and on the other side is this empty dreamscape bathed in waves of lights as the song builds and crashes. It represents what Mirabelle thinks she would have seen or could see if only she had her own door, as portrayed by her abstract thought. At the heart of the song, it doesn't matter to Mirabelle what her power would be, just anything would work, because proving herself to her family is what's most important to her, because she wants them to see her as special, just like all the others. The whole song is soaked in this fantasy, as Mirabelle gets further and further from reality, the song gets brighter and more bombastic, until eventually, Eventually, the excitement dies down and the colors fade as Mirabel returns to the reality where she has nothing to boast about. Am I too late for a miracle? After the song, a tile falls from La Casita and breaks, and Mirabel witnesses cracks form all throughout the foyer, setting around the candle, which flickers as if about to go out. So then Mirabel runs back to the party to let everyone know that the sky is falling and somehow manages to quiet the booming crowd to say this? Well, isn't that something? She didn't even need to tap a glass or ring a bell or nothing. And of course, this leads to that scene where the main character takes everyone back to see the thing they saw, but then it's gone and they're all like, but I really saw it. It was right here. <laughs> Stupid child. You do not have enough evidence to prosecute this case. So stop making things up. But I'm not making this up. It cut my hand. <laughs> it was just an acorn. <laughs> it was just an acorn. <laughs> Why would you scare us for no reason? Are you crazy? Though to be completely fair, that song was like 70% imagination, so who knows, maybe she is a little crazy. I still don't like that they had to pull the entire crowd out of the room just to belittle Mirabelle as much as possible. Like, yeah, I get it, but the severe secondhand humiliation, I could do without. No one likes to be that guy who embarrasses themselves during Christmas, you know? There is nothing wrong with La Casa Madrigal. The magic is strong! And so are the drinks. Ah, alcohol reference. Now, now that's what I like to see in my Disney movie. So great, no one believes Mirabelle. But she is confident that she didn't just trip the hell out and can't get that moment out of her head, so she sneaks out of her room to see the candle again. But right at that moment, she encounters Abuela, who reveals that, though she did not show it then, she does believe Mirabelle that the magic may be in danger as she prays to Pedro, her late husband, for help in fixing whatever is wrong. And so, having secretly listened in on this plea, Mirabelle decides to take on this quest herself and sets off to figure out what is causing the discord that's killing the miracle. Wait, how do I save a miracle? So, instead of a big road trip filled with obstacles like in other Disney movies, here instead we have a mystery, with Mirabelle playing the role of the detective. With each piece of info, she's led to another character who then gives her a new lead on the next lead and so on. But before officially beginning her investigation, it is established that later that night, the Madrigals are to be hosting dinner for Mariano Guzman, to whom Isabella is to be betrothed. So just like the previous night, there's pressure for everyone to be on their best behavior, including Mirabelle, who Abuela now has her eyes on. Anyway, Mirabelle starts off her inquiry with her cousin Dolores, who tells her that she could hear Louisa being nervous about something around the time when Mirabelle saw the crowd. So then Mirabelle starts following Louisa around town as she does her chores, constantly pestering her to tell her what's wrong. Nothing's wrong! Wow, uh, sorry, that, uh, that snuck out there. What I meant was, um, why would anything be wrong? This then leads into our next song, all about Louisa and the burden she has to carry on her shoulders. What makes this song unique is that unlike the rest of the songs, which are more grounded in reality, this one goes full music video mode with lots of heavily symbolic and non-literal visual direction. In one shot, Louisa holds the earth, invoking images of Atlas, the Greek god who held the earth and in some interpretations even the heavens and the whole universe upon his shoulders. And in another shot, we see Hercules fighting Cerberus, whom Louisa takes over for, not unlike the actual myth where Hercules takes over for Atlas to hold up the sky. Well, technically that was Heracles, but I'm not gonna get into that. Anyway, like Hera Hercules, Louisa too is an exceptional being with the weight of the world on her shoulders and the incredible pressure that brings. Earlier, Mirabelle tries to keep up appearances and not let anyone know how her she is on the inside, and this song is the revelation that her sister Louisa and nay, even the rest of the family are the same way. Not wanting to let their insecurities out for fear of what will arise. Cause you see, when you're told that you're so talented your whole life, the need to constantly live up to that messes with your head. With the pressure to succeed also comes the fear of failure, to trip, to make some sort of mistake. In Louisa's mind, she is constantly protecting her family from disaster and views a single mistake as a chance for one of them to get hurt, and so she has to remain strong. Yet her ultimate fantasy is a world where she is free from the shackles of responsibility and doesn't have to work so hard just to keep everything running, taking the form of a vast open sky as opposed to the crushing solid rock of reality. Going back to Atlas holding up the world, someone has to do it, so Louisa does it, so the others don't have to. As shown in the final bit where Louisa holds up Black Casita, the whole 
holds down the mountains and even the sky. Like Atlas and Heracles before her, now it is Louisa who holds the world on her shoulders. No cracks, no breaks, no mistakes, no pressure. Aww. I think you're carrying way too much. Ah. Maybe I overdo it. Yep. So through the art of standing there and being supportive, Mirabelle finally gets Louisa to talk. She admits that she's nervous because since Mirabelle saw the cracks, she's been losing her powers. And tells Mirabelle that she heard talk about a strange vision that Bruno had just before he disappeared and that she should track it down. Ah, uh, is this the part where we talk about Bruno? No, 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 not yet. Well, maybe a little. You see, Bruno had the ability to see into the future, so Mirabel goes to his room to find out what he saw before he vanished. And before she enters, it is made apparent that La Casita has no power in Bruno's room, and likely none of the other special rooms as well. So, this seems to imply that these rooms are not actually part of La Casita. Not technically. So what are they? Illusions? Pocket dimensions? Aurora Borealis? We may never know. So despite lacking a safety net, Mirabel enters Bruno's room, which is taken the form of a giant pit filled with sand, stairs, complete with a dead end and a gap. Well, you know, when you lose, you lose. Time to turn back in. No, don't you do it. <laughs> don't you do it. Don't you. Oh! 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 Like I said, I really didn't have that much confidence in the film going in, so I was playing Pokemon Shining Pearl while watching it. And look, they have a shiny Zubat. Isn't that crazy? I wasn't even shiny hunting for it or anything. Like, what are the odds? Don't look at me like that. <laughs> anyway, back to the movie. Mirabelle reaches the end of Bruno's room where she finds a shattered pane of glass depicting the vision that Bruno had, and finds out that she is in it with a broken casita behind her. But as Mirabelle tries to literally piece the mystery together, the magic begins to weaken, and Bruno's room starts to fall apart with her inside, and she narrowly escapes being buried alive. So she promptly gets the hell out of Bruno's room, but then she runs into Abuela, and Luisa, who is upset because she's losing her gift. What did you do? What did you say to her? N nothing. I... I don't... Mirabel. I have to go get the Guzmans for Isabella's engagement. Stay away from Luisa until I can talk to her. Tonight, we can't have any more problems. And whatever you're doing, stop doing it. But Mirabel has to stay determined, you hear? So she goes into the other room and starts putting the pieces together anyway. But then while she's doing this, Tia, Peppa, and Tio Felix walk in, and Mirabel takes the opportunity to ask them about Bruno. However, Peppa tries to dodge the question, making it abundantly clear that they don't talk about Bruno. But they sure can sing about him! We don't talk about Bruno, no, no, no. We don't talk about Bruno. This is, without a doubt, the most popular song from the movie, and for good reason. It features each of the characters telling us all about the predictions Bruno's made in the past and the dismay it brought, as well as all sorts of rumors and gossip making out to be this disturbing villain. I also find it very funny, because Mirabelle doesn't have many parts to sing in this song, and so for most of it, she's just awkwardly dancing along to match her family's energy. Although, I'm getting some deja vu here. We don't talk about Bruno? Where have I heard that before? Silencio Bruno! Silencio Bruno! Silencio Bruno! Silencio Bruno! Oh, <laughs> Man, what is Disney have against Bruno. I guess they like Borat better? At the tail end of the song, the Guzmans are on their way to La Casita for Isabella's proposal, and the various parts of the song all coalesce together. Just as Mirabelle starts to put together the pieces of Bruno's vision, the shards of bad experiences related to Bruno are all brought together in the final verses as they dance circles around the truth. After the song, Mirabelle is caught with Bruno's completed vision by her papa, and she tells him about everything she saw, but he tells her not to say anything, since it's time for dinner with the Guzmans, and no one can know about this, or else it'll be a disaster. I know. However, Dolores and her super ears overhear the whole thing and are itching to tell everyone. Okay, it's obvious what happens next, and this is really confusing, because I don't know who to be mad at. Dolores, despite knowing full well what's at stake, I mean, let's be real, she probably heard everything that Mirabelle was doing, but told Camilo anyway. Camilo, for telling his papa Felix, who he should know can't keep a secret from his wife, or Felix, who knows for a fact that just the suggestion that it might rain caused the weather to go to shit when they got married, but told her this earth-shattering secret anyways if it wouldn't affect her mood, which as 
as you may remember, controls the weather even inside. Guys, shut up. The X-Men should not be freaking out at dinner. Well, after that catastrophe, while everyone's distracted, Mirabel notices Raz carrying away the pieces of Bruno's vision. After following them for a bit, she's led to a crawl space behind the walls and Bruno. Mirabelle gives Chase adamant to find out the truth no matter what, but Bruno loses her to pits. Classic Bruno. Mirabelle comes close to falling to her death a lot in this movie. Isn't that weird? You're very sweaty. <laughs> Oh yeah, we're inside. There's no backrooms, TARDIS technology in the crawl space. Why would there be a pit? So let's finally talk about Bruno. The song went to great lengths to portray Bruno as this malevolent force who efficiently sowed despair among the family and the townsfolk. Yet the real Bruno doesn't live up to the rumors. Instead, he's just a bit of an awkward, superstitious weirdo. He knocks on wood, throws salt over his shoulder, holds his breath, and even avoids stepping on cracks. Specifically, cracks formed in La to that predate the ones Mirabel saw, which Bruno had been patching up on the crawl space where he'd been living all this time. Guy's a real rat man, and no, I don't mean like a man of the rats, granted he's that too. I mean like Doug Ratman, that guy from Portal who would scribble on the walls. And you know, Dolores said she could always hear Bruno sort of muttering and mumbling, and what do you hear when you stand too close to one of the Ratman murals? <laughs> Hmm, no wonder all those spooky rumors exist. Thanks, Dolores. I actually feel pretty bad for Bruno, you know? Like, we could argue about who got the best power, <coughs> shape-shifting, but I think we can all agree that Bruno got the rawest deal of all. You see, every one of the Madrigals gets their own room that reflects their abilities. Antonio got this tropical animal paradise, and Isabella got this wondrous floral landscape, but poor freaking Bruno got this shitty, dangerous sand room where he has to walk up tons of stairs just to use his ability. Also, I'm pretty sure Bruno had to sleep in there, no? Children living in La Casita start off in a nursery and then move to their own room upon getting their power, and while well, Bruno probably wasn't sleeping in the Ding Dang nursery, so damn, this is where he lived. His living situation now might be better, actually. Or better yet, it's not great, but he's cool with it because he was born with low standards. Lots of parallels are drawn between Mirabel and Bruno, as both are family outcasts but still love their family despite that. Mirabel was told to stay out of the way earlier because she was seen as a burden on the family, and the revelation here is that Bruno left for the same reason, because he thought he was in the way, that it would be easier for everyone if he just disappeared. But the vision was different, it, it would change, and, th and there was no one answer, no clear fate, like your future was undecided. But I knew how it was gonna look. I knew what everyone would think because I'm Bruno and everyone always assumes the worst, so... So... You... left... to protect me? Louisa brought up the idea of how having a gift can be more stressful than not having one, but Bruno brings up the idea that the gift itself can be a curse. Case in point, Peppa. Her emotions control the weather. She doesn't control the weather, her emotions do. What a ripoff! So if she's upset, a rain cloud appears over her head, which stresses her out even more. Nothing will lead to a drizzle, and a drizzle will lead to a sprinkle! Clear skies. And so most of the time when we see her, she is just a wreck, and it makes you think that perhaps she'd be better off not having to worry about needing to be happy in order to be happy. And dry. Or what about Dolores, who hears everything? You can't just turn that off. If you hear everything, you're gonna hear something you didn't want to hear eventually, you hear? Might I add that Dolores is the second oldest grandchild behind Isabella. You can use your imagination on what horrible things she might have unwillingly heard. And then of course, there's Bruno, who is paralyzed by a fear of the future and the unknown, hence all his skittish, superstitious behavior. The idea of keeping up appearances is a major theme in the film, that once you've gained a certain reputation, it's hard to break from it. Like with Bruno, whose negative reputation made it impossible for him to do any good by the family or avoid second guessing himself. Yeah, my, my gift wasn't helping the family, but, uh, but I love my family, you know? So after a lengthy talk about Bruno, Mirabel gets the idea for him to have another vision so she can find out what to do next, and oh, there's Antonio. He freaking disappeared for a while, didn't he? Probably the only example I can point to in this movie where a character was snubbed from substantial screen time. After his ceremony, poof. We are all thankful for Antonio's wonderful new gift. I told them to warm up your seat. This is my room. The rats told me everything. Don't eat those.
So, since Bruno's cave is a wreck, they hold the ritual in Antonio's room instead. It's a storm of uncertainty in the future, but Mirabel latches onto a golden butterfly, Una Mariposa, flapping in the breeze. Get it? Butterfly effect. One small change making a big difference. They follow it and see Mirabel hugging someone in front of the Encanto, but their identity is obscured. It becomes clearer. It's... It's... <laughs> Yup, Isabella, the one who hates Mirabelle the most and the one who Mirabelle hates the most, especially after Hurricane Guzman. So, reluctantly, she enters Isabella's room and awkwardly tries to make up, but Isa is not having it. Get out. Everything was perfect. Abuela was happy. The family was happy. You want to be a better sister? Apologize for ruining my life. Go on. Apologize. I am sorry <sighs> that your life is so great. Ow. And neither is Mirabelle, who instead of being nice decides to be honest and tells Isa off, resulting in a shouting match where Isabella reveals that she never actually wanted to get married in the first place and was only doing it because it was what the family expected of her. And then, because she got so angry, Isabella unintentionally creates a cactus and is fascinated by it, leading into our next song. I just made something unexpected Something sharp Something new Isa uh, this is the part where we... It's not symmetrical or perfect, but it's beautiful, and it's mine. What else can I do? Wait, bring it in, bring it in. Like how Louise's song went to great lengths to develop her, this song does the same for Isabella. Isabella's power is that she can control plants, but for most of the movie, she only ever grows vines or flowers, and the forming of the cactus makes her realize that there's more to her power than she thought. And that's because flowers and such were all she'd ever been told people wanted to see. Her power, outward appearance, and nay, even her entire being, groomed and trimmed just like a flower bed. It's made clear throughout the film that Isabella is the product of eldest child favoritism. Whenever Isabella appeared on screen early in the movie, she was consistently met with a Applause and admiration. In the portraits taken after each child received their gift, you'll notice they're all the same, except for Isabella's, which is not only decorated, but Abuela breaks her trend of holding the candle with both hands to put one on Isabella's shoulder. And during We Don't Talk About Bruno, Isabella is the only one who got a positive prophecy. He told me that the life of my dreams would be promised and someday be mine. He told me that my power would grow like the grapes that thrive on the vine. And it was thanks to Mirabelle and how brutally honest she was earlier that Issa was able to make the revelation that maybe what the family wants her to be isn't the same as what she wants to be. I'm so sick of pretty, I want something true. There's a clear message here about separating perfection from goodness. Issa's decorations were always perfectly grown and perfectly arranged, but the absence of flaws made them all similar and samey to her. Now compare that to the oddity that was the cactus, which was better in her opinion because it was more of what she wanted, even if it wasn't perfect. And as a result, Isabella begins to see the value in things she once saw as flawed, and by extension Mirabelle, whom she looked down upon so much before due to her shortcomings. And so she forgives Mirabelle for what happened at dinner, now reels into making one or a couple mistakes doesn't ruin a person after all. You know... I could have said it better myself. So now, finally seeing each other properly for the first time, Isabelle and Mirabelle embrace, just as Bruno foresaw, thus strengthening the Encanto and repairing the cracks. Not just the cracks in La Casita, but the cracks in their relationship. You're a bad influence. <laughs> what is going on? But then, Abuela shows up, who spotted Mirabelle and Isabella making a mess of themselves up on the roof during the song. By this point in the movie, it's assumed that Mirabelle's relationship with Isabella was what was causing the discord. She teases Mirabelle early in the story, her engagement is a major plot point, and the two of them didn't really get along before all this, too. So then it becomes incredibly unnerving when here it is revealed that Abuela and the expectations she put on the whole family was the source of it the whole time. You have to stop, Mirabelle! The crack started with you. Bruno left because of you. Luisa's losing her powers. Isabella's out of control because of you. 
I don't know why you weren't given a gift, but it is not an excuse for you to hurt this family. And then, in a moment of absolute clarity, when given one final chance to just turn tail and run, to just take the scolding and not make things worse, Mirabelle instead decides to speak up, stand up for what she believes in, and tell Abuela the truth that she has discovered. Because when you know that something is wrong, keeping it bottled up and hiding it only hurts everyone and doesn't allow for true healing or change. That is the danger of caring about your reputation and social status more than what is right. Miguel, uh, my reputation, it is <laughs> very important to me. The magic is strong! Everything is fine! We are the Madrigals! Mirabel! And that desire is exactly what leads to people like Bruno and like Mirabel to be ostracized by their peers because they've been labeled as the problem, when in reality they were the ones fighting it. Mirabel actually did fix everything, with Isabella, because she was brave enough to tell her the truth and pave the path to change. Because if you don't confront your problems head on, they stay there. And so despite the risk, despite the potential consequences, Mirabel does the same here because speaking up for herself and everyone else against Abuela is what is right. Bruno didn't care about this family. He loves this family. I love this family. We all love this family. You're the one that doesn't care. You're the one breaking our home. Don't you the ever! The miracle is dying because of you! And so, the cracks. The cracks that break the candle's backs. You see, while it takes physical form in the movie, La Casita and the candle are actually representative of the family as a whole. The candle burns bright because of the incredible love and harmony present in the family's bonds with one another. That's why Mirabel repairing her relationship with Isabella made it burn brighter. And it's also why the pressure to succeed and the expectations placed on everyone by Abuela has caused La Casita to crumble. She got so swept up in helping the community and using everyone's gifts to make the family proud and maintaining the magical status that she forgot the people attached to these miracles. And because because Mirabel didn't get one, she felt like she didn't matter, that she was invisible, like a ghost, always told to step aside and let someone else shine. It wasn't her that caused the Discord to emerge, rather her displacement from the family itself, and to a lesser extent, Bruno's too. And then, when everyone found out what was happening, and Mirabel was made to take most of the blame, that is why it became so much worse, as everyone's relationship with her became that much more strained. And when Mirabel finally calls Abuela out as the source of the Discord, La Casita crumbles because they both blame each other for ruining everything, which in turn tears this family apart. And so, so, La Casita crumbles, and despite Mirabel's effort, the candle, the Encanto, the Undying Flame, goes out. <clears throat> what? What? Nothing? Is that why it's called Shining Pearl? Anyway, surrounded by the rubble of her former home, Mirabel looks on at the rest of her family, internally wondering if this is all her fault. And off to the side, Abuela, wondering the exact same thing. Mirabel tried to save the magic, but she failed, and is completely devastated. And so, she leaves, much like Bruno before her. Everyone goes out to look for Mirabel, but no one can find her, until she is found by Abuela, who instead of blaming Mirabel again, tries to make things right. I've never been able to come back here. This river is where we were given our miracle. Where Abuelo Pedro... I thought we would have a different life. I thought I would be a different woman. And we lead into another song, retelling the story of Abuelo Pedro and Abuela Alma, mirroring the start of the film where Mirabel was told this same story. This is the song that puts the entire film into context. It's a soft, love-sung lullaby played over their lives together, with each major focal point being punctuated with a candle. A candle for when they see each other, a candle when they get married, and a candle to light their way after getting chased off by the conquistadors. The song itself is Alma's memory of Pedro singing it to her, so it plays over the story of their life together to show how everything she did, she did to make right on not only the miracle she was given, but the second chance that Pedro gave her, because she was so afraid of losing everything again. Like Mirabel and Luisa and Isabella, Alma had been cracking under the pressure she put on the family too, the pressure to be what she thought she needed to be to keep the family together, which ironically is what tore them all apart.
After the song, Mirabelle and the audience now see just how much Alma had sacrificed to get this far. And mirroring the part where she listed all the things that were Mirabelle's fault earlier, Mirabelle flips the script and lists all the things that only happened thanks to Alma. We were saved because of you. We were given a miracle because of you. We are a family because of you. And nothing could ever be broken that we can't fix together. And so, just as the miracle had given Alma another chance, Mirabelle offers her the same hand to start again. During Bruno's vision of what would fix the magic, Mirabelle saw herself embracing somebody, accompanied by a yellow butterfly. And at the time, they thought Mirabelle had to make up with Isabella, but here it's revealed that it was actually Alma all along. Tell me this movie is not a masterpiece. It gets better. In the final song, about building things back from the ground up, every loose end is tied up and everyone gets a moment to shine. Alma lets it be known that she will never again forget what's truly most important. Everybody finally talks about Bruno and he's welcomed back into the family. The townspeople, after all the work that Madrigal's had put into giving back to the community, finally repay the goodwill and build them a new house in their time of need. Dolores sucks up with the man of her dreams and Louisa finally gets to relax and let someone else handle all of the hard labor. And then, at the end of it all, the house is completed except for one small part, the door. They hand the doorknob to Mirabelle, which has a large M engraved on it, for Madrigal. But come to think of it, all of the personal doors knobs had that person's first initial on them too, like B for Bruno. And suddenly, this moment is looking very familiar. Just like when Mirabelle held Antonio's hand when he was afraid to go to his door, Antonio holds Mirabelle's hand to lead her to the front door. And as she walks, she's given the recognition she'd always wanted from every member of her family. She reaches Alma at the end, standing next to the door, who once again tells her to open her eyes. And what does she See? I see me. All of me. Because you see, the real reason she was denied a door at the beginning is because her door was actually the front door, you hear? Because you know the true miracle was family all along. The M doesn't stand for Magigal, it stands for Mirabelle. What? Ah, uh, here come the waterworks. Oh, has it happened? Has something finally pierced this tough iron shell I wear around my heart? Answer me, plant. Is this not the greatest ending ever made? Well... It, it was kind of bollocks, wasn't it? I mean, they destroy the magical and to bring it right back? Where have I heard that before? It's complete bullsh... I can explain that, but to do it, we're gonna have to look at another Disney movie. Moana, from 2016, the last Disney princess movie before Encanto. I meant the last original Disney princess movie. Oh yeah, Raya, I forgot about it again. Anyway, Encanto and Moana actually have a lot in common, from the heroic, likeable protagonist who wants something more, even down to the excellent soundtrack. And, as you might have guessed, Moana also has a moment similar to when La Casita crumbles, which all has to do with Maui here. Maui is a demigod, and with his magic fish hook, the source of his power has done all number of amazing things to win the favor of humanity. And he loves this thing. It's so important to him that a good fifth of the movie is tied around retrieving it. So then, once Moana and Maui have retrieved his hook and try to take on Teka, it is a huge blow to Maui to see that his hook is damaged. He went on this quest to become a hero in the eyes of the people again, and he thinks he can't do that if his hook is destroyed. Without my hook, I am nothing. That's not true! Without my hook, I am nothing! So he bails on Moana. But then, in a moment of growth, when Moana tries to then take on Teka alone, Maui shows up and sacrifices his fish hook in order to give Moana the opportunity to get past Teka and restore the heart of Te Fiti. Because Maui learns that it's not his hook or his powers that makes him Maui, it's just him. All of him. Maybe the gods found you for a reason. Maybe the ocean brought you to them because it saw someone who is worthy of being saved. The miracle is not some magic that you've got. The miracle is you, not some gift, just you. The miracle is you, all of you, all of you. But the 
gods aren't the ones who make you Maui. You are. But then Tafiti gives Maui a new hook, and he's flying around like, Woo! And I'm like, what the hell? What, he's gonna make this big sacrifice only to get it back immediately afterwards? What bullshit is this? And wait just a ding ding second, Maui's the one who stole the thing majig in the first place, so why does he get rewarded for putting it back? That's like abducting a cat and then returning it when someone puts up a bounty. Well, hook, no hook. I'm Maui. <laughs> Anyway, the point here is that, yes, Laka seems are crumbling and then immediately coming back feels similar to this annoying part from Moana, which felt wholly unnecessary given the apparent message. In Encanto, it's shown that the various gifts can be more of a curse. Exhibit A, Bruno. Exhibit B, Peppa. And a large part of the moral of the movie is that it's not their talents or abilities that make them special, it's everything besides that. Their personalities, who they are at the core. Like Mirabelle, who never had a gift, the rest of the family can still be special with that one too. And so, it would make sense if the movie ended with the Madrigals remaining powerless and learning to accept themselves for who they are. But I like the actual ending more. You see, La Casita is meant to represent the family as a whole. Heck, the miracle that created it was born from Alma's love for her family and her desire to keep them together. When La Casita collapsed, that represented how the cracks in this family that had been building up for so long had finally gotten out of hand, leaving the family in disarray. So then when Mirabel slots in the final piece to the new Casita, it's meant to show that with a lot of honesty and hard work, broken relationships can be mended, that the love that made this family so special doesn't have to die. And to cement this, they take another photo, only this time with Mirabel at the center, quite literally putting her back in the picture, and the movie ends. Encanto, what can I say? Es excelente! The story is incredibly heartful, the characters are really likable, and the songs range from catchy to poignant to beautiful. Mirabelle is a very strong protagonist. What makes her special is that the rest of her family members do what they do because it's what the family wants, but Mirabelle does what she does because it's what the family needs. She starts off the film thinking she's been dealt the worst hand out of everyone, only to realize that the rest of her family, including her abuela, feel that pressure and insecurity too. And there's a lot of genuine heart in the scenes where Mirabelle reconnects with them. She gave Antonio the confidence he needed, she taught Luisa not to be so hard on herself, she brought Bruno back home, she helped Isabella realize what she truly wanted to be, and she reminded Alma of what was really most important. Her walk at the end is truly earned because you realize she spent this whole movie mending relationships and tying her family closer together. Back into a tight-knit community. And it's all that and more that makes Encanto a magical movie and a modern masterpiece. So anyway, Puss in Boots was way better. Bananas. Bananas.